Thank you all for, for having me. And tell me if you can't hear me, I think this mic is working. Um, who loves to be stuck in traffic? <laughs> I knew I would see some hands. <laughs> That's funny. Who of you uh, has been stuck in traffic any time lately? <laughs> and I guess you were just sitting there thinking, wow, this is the life, right? Um, not me. I don't, I don't like it, um, actually. Um, the Beltline, uh, I, I think that we're going to figure it out, actually, if, you, if you're sitting there wondering ever, uh, who, are these, who are these city planners? Who are these people that uh, created this mess? Um, uh, I think we're going to figure it out. It's, I'm not sure how it's going to happen um, or, who, or who the ideas are going to come from, um, but, I'm, but I'm pretty sure we're going to figure it out. Um, we're, we're fairly resourceful as a people. When the Europeans came to uh, the New World, uh, they found a lot of uh, great resources, great rivers, uh, immense forests, uh, minerals, and uh, all kinds of things that created a great nation. They built cities that powered uh, the economy, uh, like this as uh, St. Louis in the early days, but Detroit and Pittsburgh and Los Angeles. Um, the government uh, took a role in opening up new land and providing uh, 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 political and financial sort of support and resources. Businesses innovated and created new uh, ways of moving around, um, new, new uh, ways of living and building cities. And, um, and people uh, did pretty amazing things. Over about 100 years of doing that, though, we started to notice that there were some downside to the way that we were growing, um, like uh, tenement life in, in New York and, and skyscrapers in New York, or uh, chemical and industrial pollution. This is the Cuyahoga River on fire in uh, Cleveland. It actually caught fire over a dozen times over the course of 100 years. There was a downside to that, the way that we were growing, the way that we were building cities the way that we were taking care of, our, uh, of the earth and of our natural resources. And so we started to change the way that we did things. Um, not because anybody said, hey, um, let's do this today, but it started with millions of little people, daily decisions of people in, each of, in their families and started to uh, change the way that, that things happened. Um, we started uh, moving away from the dirty, overcrowded, dangerous cities. Uh, we invented uh, new ways of living um, out in the country where the air was open and, and, and clear, we invented uh, automobiles and we invested in highways. And the, <clears throat> so the private market started creating new models for growth, new models for business practices and, and development. The governments uh, responded with in innovations like highways and invested in those and, and home loans and all kinds of things that totally changed the way that we build the world and the way that we all lived and powered an economy that has lasted until uh, quite recently. Um, building places like Atlanta into amazingly uh, successful uh, places and, and really quite wonderful places to live. Um, over the course of those 30 or 60 years though, there have been new challenges that we've created. We've left behind the sort of um, yellow fever and uh, you know uh, infectious diseases that came from the dirty old city but we've created new kinds of problems chronic diseases and the escalating health care costs we've decimated our urban communities um, like Detroit here um, through that kind of growth and we've created a structure for growth that is uh, that's that's fundamentally challenging it's not resilient there's only one way to live in a place like this where you have to drive in your car to get everywhere, which means that you don't get much physical exercise. It significantly challenges our, our public health, land consumption, and other environmental kinds of challenges. And so I would argue and think, um, and we, we spend a lot of time in traffic, at least a lot of us here in Atlanta do, um, and, and it's leaving behind other places. This is the shopping center where I grew up in Chambly. Uh, which when I was lived, lived there in the 1970s and 80s, it was sort of in its prime. It was full of, full of stores. There were two competing grocery stores. There were drug stores. There was everything you would want was there. And this is from last fall when I went out to visit. It was pretty sad. And there's a cycle of this kind of growth um, that, that, that changes where we start to do things differently. We, we then both through government and through business 
uh, invest in that new kind of growth, and then, we, and then it causes new problems, and we start solving those problems and change, change the way we do things. So I think that uh, we're starting to see a new kind of change. We're responding to the challenges of the way we've been growing for the last 60 years, and we're starting to create new, new things and grow differently. Sometimes they're really small things. This is a project in um, Los Angeles where they just closed a short section of a street and took it over, took the space away from cars and used it for people. Um, so it's a new little public plaza. It cost about $5 because they didn't spend any money on it, a little bit of paint and some umbrellas. Uh, but if you're ever in LA, the, the, the best place for breakfast in town is a little uh, bagel shop right there. It's, I think I've had the most best breakfast I've ever had in my life right there, sitting in the middle of what used to be a street with cars and buses blowing by. It's pretty amazing. If you've uh, been to New York, you've, or you've probably seen the High Line, it's one of the top tourist destinations in New York City now. It's the repurp taking an old elevated railroad and repurposing it as a public space. It changes the way people are living in Chelsea. It has invested billions of dollars of new private investment in the meatpacking meat district. It's unbelievable uh, kind of response. And on a much, that's a little mile and a half little project, little boutique-y, beautiful kind of thing. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is the Los Angeles River, 52 miles of concrete channel. You've seen it in the Terminator and Greece. But there's a movement growing since uh, the 1980s of grassroots movement to change that back into a river and say this is, this is why Los Angeles is here. This is a river. Why can't we uh, invest in bike trails and greenways and economic development along this corridor and make it a, into a place that you might want to actually be? Um, it changes the physical growth of the city, but it also changes the way that we think about the places that we live so that instead of going out and destroying more forest and farmland, we actually repurpose existing places and make them stronger. And the Beltline is that kind of a project. <clears throat> How many of you know what the Beltline is at all? Anybody been out on the Beltline recently on the East Side Trail? Fantastic. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But the Beltline is that same kind of idea where it's not only changing the physical form of Atlanta, but it's changing the way that people think about Atlanta, what they might, where they might want to choose to live, where they might want to do on a weekend when they have visitors come from out of town. Um, and it's actually happening, which is actually the coolest part. It's changing the way that we, that we think about Atlanta. Um, because it asks this question, not deliberately, not, not because the Atlanta Regional Commission or somebody says, hey guys, what do you think? What kind of place do we want to live? Um, but because enough people incrementally on their own uh, s spent their own time asking that question and then investing the volunteer hours and uh, years of their lives basically to make it in that kind of place. Not just me, but uh, thousands of people in Atlanta sort of have made the Beltline happen. Um, so if you don't know what the Beltline is, just a really short recap, the Beltline is a 22 mile loop of old, uh, mostly abandoned railroads that circle downtown Atlanta. Atlanta's a railroad town, it was built by railroads, but those railroads come downtown. Um, these are uh, later railroads that were built in a loop around the city in the, per in the periphery. They were built to expand the industrial base of the city, but pretty soon as the city grew, they got left behind. Industry moved out to the highways, and the, and the urban neighborhoods went into decline. And so it was sort of left behind for a long time. But now the city's growing faster than most of the suburban counties. People are rediscovering these communities and in the process rediscovering this land. So there's 45 neighborhoods along the way. There's about 100,000 people currently within walking distance. And the idea is to transform that 22 mile loop um, into um, a transit line, like a streetcar or trolley, and a bicycle and walking trail. So it's a linear greenway, 22 miles, the transit connects to MARTA at each of the four compass points, and it connects to an emerging regional trail system. So you'll be able to ride in on the Stone Mountain Trail, go around the Beltline and head out the Silver Comet Trail and ride all the way to Alabama, which kind of plays with your mind, right? If you're from Atlanta, <laughs> to think that you can make that kind of a trip on bike without really even crossing a city street. That's amazing, right? Um, so, the, the project was my graduate thesis in 1999 at Georgia Tech in architecture and city planning. A couple of years later, I was working with an architecture firm and I was telling my friends about it at work and we just, they thought it was a cool idea. 
So we put together some letter and some maps and we mailed it out to everybody we could think of, the, the governor, the mayor, all the regional planning agencies and got some letters back saying, hey, nice, good, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> but got a, a great response from Kathy Willard. She was on uh, city council for district six and chair of the city council's transportation committee, which is why she got the letter. And she had just had a meeting of all the regional planning agencies saying, what are you doing for Atlanta, for the city of Atlanta, which if you don't know is only one tenth of the regional population. And, she, and they, came, uh, they came to her and they met with her. They showed her what they were doing and they were all about moving people from way outside of town into downtown and back home at the end of the day, not really for people who live in the city who are more likely to ride it, more likely to want it, more likely to pay for it, have been paying for it for 30 years with MARTA, and a large proportion of people who are dependent on transit to get around because they can't afford a car. There really wasn't anything for them. It's not to say that there's anything wrong with the other strategy, but it, there just wasn't anything for those people and so for her constituents basically. And so she went back to her office and this letter was on her desk and she said, wow, this is kind of cool. <laughs> so uh, she invited us to come down. We went to a town hall meeting and the neighborhood sort of loved the idea. And so then we started this process for about two and a half years. We went to every neighborhood group, every business group, every church group, Rotary Club, anybody and every bear. I've stood up here and talked about the be th that story of the Beltline in this very room uh, on many occasions. And um, and it's amazing what happened because the, the people really fell in love with it, but they also took ownership of it and made it their own project and then, you know, added a lot more of other ideas. So in addition to the transit way and the trail going the full 22 miles, that's, ex that's transportation. This idea of economic development that maintains quality of life in communities that are already seeing new growth, but then attracts that growth to the south and the west side of town that hasn't seen any new investment in the last 30 years. And then green space connecting places like Piedmont Park, the Carter Center, the zoo and the botanical gardens, those things together in a way that people can get around town and see it. Those were the core things that we went to talk to people about. But what was amazing is that we had all these great conversations where there, all these people really loved the idea and they brought their own ideas to the table. So you had community organ organizers talking with environmentalist groups and developers all on the same page, all wanting the same thing, which in and of itself is quite an amazing thing to do. Uh, but you also had people like housing advocates talking to preservationists saying, maybe if we work together, we can put our people who need housing in your old buildings and that'll all work together, not only for the Beltline, but for the city as a whole. So it started a lot of really amazing conversations. And then suddenly the project became more than it, what it started with. It, now it's in addition to 700 acres of existing parks, it's 1,400 acres of new parks. And if you go around there today, you've probably seen them, like the historic Fourth Ward Park in particular. Um, but also on the west side, the west side park will d be twice the size of Piedmont Park. Um, it's not open yet, but if you take the tour, you get to see, you get the keys and you get to see them. Um, the Beltline is also the largest affordable housing initiative the city's ever in undertaken. But that's all for new housing, which is great. But what about the people who live in these poor communities now that want to stay in their house to benefit from the Beltline, but they might see rising taxes and rents. Um, there's now tools in place to help those folks stay in their um, neighborhood. Public art community said, wow, what a great place for really signature, beautiful public art to enrich people's lives. The preservation people came out and said, this, we're a railroad town, let's take these old tunnels and bridges and showcase what Atlanta's history is all about. Um, Trees Atlanta came and said, we're gonna be planting a lot of trees, let's be thoughtful about it and actually teach kids and residents and visitors about the tree canopy, but not, not only that, but other e urban ecological issues like stormwater management, invasive species, and all kinds of things like that. Um, the public health community, the Center for Quality Growth and Regional Development at Georgia Tech, in partnership with the CDC, they've done studies that prove that communities that have access to transit and trails are healthier communities because it encourages people to walk, reduces their risk of um, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, all kinds of things. And so they've done a health impact assessment of the Beltline now and they're going to continue to monitor as it builds out to, sh to show how the Beltline specifically has positive public health benefits to, to people here in Atlanta. Um, these are old industrial sites too and a lot of them are contaminated so by, drive, by incentivizing redevelopment you're actually incentivizing paying for those sites to be cleaned up and cleared which is fantastic. And then the street framework, which is this idea of a much broader sort of uh, public realm so that these big industrial tracks get broken up by new streets and blocks 
so that people who live in the neighborhoods um, neck nearby can get to the Beltline, but also so that the dimension of the block that's being built um, is at a human scale, so it encourages walking. Um, so this is the Beltline, the distance from downtown. You can see some cool old tunnels and structures. Um, a lot of underserved communities, especially in the south and west, that could use um, a little bit of incentive. And then you can see this is what it used to look like on the East Side Trail, but now, of course, there's uh, a brand new trail you'll see in a minute. And, and some beautiful, really uh, natural spaces that can be uh, highlighted uh, through the park plan. This is a great diagram where you can see the, the railroad there, the pink line, is the, where the railroad was, but of course it's all abandoned and overgrown with kudzu. Flanking either side of that are the industrial properties, most of which are abandoned in this case, or at least underutilized. And then on the side of that are the sort of neighborhoods that Atlanta loves, you know, the leafy green canopy and little bungalow streetcar kind of neighborhoods. In this case, that's West End on the right and Oakland City on the left. <clears throat> um, and then this is a great example of sort of how it works. This is a neighborhood called Capital View Manor in southwest Atlanta um, off of Metropolitan Parkway. If you ever uh, are in the neighborhood, uh, stop by. That's my house. Uh, you're, you're welcome to. I might, hopefully I'm home. Um, the red is the belt line sort of going by the neighborhood. The yellow is this obsolete sort of abandoned industrial land that, goes, that follows along the way. Um, so in plan view, then, you can see how the railroad becomes uh, the belt line, both transit and trail, linear greenway. Um, new parks where the city already owns some land and connecting trails where there are ab other abandoned rail spurs. Um, infill housing on all the vacant lots in the neighborhood. Um, with new ho homes and businesses. The extension of that public realm, the extension of the streets from the neighborhood to the north across the site so that people in the neighborhood, that's Pittsburgh to the north, can get to the Beltline, <laughs> but also so that those blocks are dimensioned to create a walking district like uh, you would need to, to live up to the sort of potential of the site. Each one of those blocks could accommodate the Empire State Building. You know, it won't. Um, but the important thing is that, it, like anything, in, like in Manhattan, you can have a brownstone or a skyscraper within the same urban block. We're not, we don't have to predict the future, we just have to accommodate whatever it might turn out to be. Some new parks as a part of that plan, and then filling in the, that, in, that former industrial area with probably medium density that supports the land values, but also the transit ridership, but is still compatible with the adjacent neighborhood. That's sort of how it works, but what's amazing is that I guess it's not really amazing, right? The <laughs> all we're really doing is we're taking those big abandoned industrial sites and we're overlaying in them a public realm um, that's not that that's that's a model uh, that you can find a model for anywhere in the world. Um, I my model that I use a lot is Paris because I happened to spend a year there in undergraduate at Georgia Tech in the architecture program. It was an amazing sort of experience because. Within two miles of arriving there, I dropped about 20 pounds um, because I was walking everywhere, I was eating fresh food from the local market, and it really became really clear to me how the built environment, the places that we live, and the way that we move around town has a significant impact on, the, on our health and well-being. Not to say that everybody has to live in this kind of environment, but we should be more conscious about the kinds of cities that we're building and the opportunities that we provide for physical activity, um, public transit, and things like that. Um, and what's amazing about Paris as a learning place to learn is you really see the layered uh, transportation networks that really create the city, that create this really robust um, uh, lifestyle. And so you can get on from Paris, from my apartment, within three blocks, I could get on a high-speed train and go to other major European capitals like uh, Frankfurt or Milan or Warsaw or wherever I wanted to go. Um, I could also catch a, another pretty fast train to any of the other big cities in France. Or I could get on another train called the RER, which is sort of like MARTA on steroids a little bit. It's a little bit faster. Uh, but go to the far-flung suburbs of Paris, which is an enormous, uh, enormous region. Or I could get on the metro, which is sort of the neighborhood scale link, a little bit smaller than uh, MARTA, more at the scale of a streetcar. Um, but the, it's a subway, and you could ride anywhere in town you wanted to go. And the loop there, interestingly, and you'll show this to you in a minute, is about the same size as the Beltline. So everything of historic Paris fits in a circle about the size of the Beltline. Just kind of crazy. They actually have a Beltline too, I'll show you that. 
Um, but anyway, you can get anywhere you want to go on the metro and then, you know, trams and buses. And even once you get there, you've got bikes and you've got taxis. You've got a really robust network of infrastructure to get anywhere you wanted to go. And it really creates um, a lifestyle that is pretty amazing and also healthy and uh, efficient and uh, relatively uh, inexpensive from a per person standpoint in terms of infrastructure. And then the, once you get there, the final destination, of course, you have to be able to get there. So you have to be able to walk that last three, four, five blocks. And of course, you've got sidewalks, uh, really robust public realm to do that. And that system then creates, is what creates Paris, right? It creates the Grand Boulevards. It creates the image of Paris. Uh, not only that, it creates the economy of Paris, a really wonderful, um, exciting, robust kind of place to be. Amazingly, we used to do uh, things very similarly. This is a train station in Valdosta, Georgia. You used to be able to ride the train up to Atlanta. Uh, once you got to Atlanta, you could go anywhere you wanted to go. We had 300 miles of hard track trolleys in the city of Atlanta. You could ride, you, you could ride an interurban line to Marietta, to Stone Mountain, to Chambly, where I grew up. Um, anywhere and everywhere you wanted to go, and all shut down, of course, in the late 40s. Um, but we, we, we did do that, we built that way. This is a picture of a train of a Sunday school group riding the train from, uh, from Marietta S S Square to Grant Park, right? <laughs> Tell me that's kind of crazy. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that you could do that in a reasonable amount of time. And today, it's uh, not only impossible, it's, it's kind of silly thing to think about. <laughs> I mean, really, it would take you forever. Um, so, but we used to do it, and so the, the challenges, and we used to think about new ideas. This is actually the Beltline on, at Ponce de Leon, where the old Sears building is. That was the original plan for MARTA to come up the east side of town, actually. Um, but we haven't really made any new investments in, in MARTA in about 15 years. Um, meanwhile, every other city in the country is. Um, and, and we're, you know, frankly, we're, we're ahead because we've always been ahead but we're about to be behind. And so uh, I think that it's fair to say that we should be thinking really creatively, not only about what we need to be doing, but how we're gonna get there, how we're gonna get our politics and our, you know, our momentum towards uh, supporting these kinds of, these kinds of investments. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna keep doing this, uh, getting stuck in traffic. And, and, and think about it this way, and we're not competing in town versus regional, we're not even really competing with Charlotte. We're competing with a global economy, and the global economy is expecting something quite different from what we've been building for the last 60 years, and we need to, we need to get ahead of the game. Um, what we have been doing, of course, is highways. Nothing wrong with highways. Um, I grew up in a, in a highway car-oriented kind of environment, and originally highways were just one more layer of infrastructure on top of a really robust uh, network of infrastructure. Um, Paris has highways, too. Um, and a lot of people drive cars in Paris, believe it or not. Uh, um, but, but we've devolved a point to where we, we only do that one thing, and that's all, everything is really highly dependent on cars. And in the future, it doesn't look like, when you look at all the things and you read all the books and you look at all the studies and you look at the successful places in the world right now, um, that's not what they're doing. Um, they're looking at places that are not isolated, uh, but places that are integrated. Um, and so we have to find a way for those things to happen. And it's important because it's the way we've been building for the last 60 years has not only changed the physical lay of the land pretty dramatically, um, but it's also changed the way that we think about even transit, where this is a MARTA station that maybe 10 houses worth of people could walk to, but it's really designed to drive to. And so it's a different kind of transit than what we maybe should have been investing in. And it's important, not because it's sort of warm and fuzzy and we talk about lifestyles and stuff like that, uh, which is fun, uh, but it's important. It's actually important to our health, our well-being, our economy, and everything else. Here's one metric. This is uh, physical activity as measured by obesity um, in the United States. You can see the date there is 1995. We're going to step every, up every five years till the current day. Um, you can see that in 1995, about half the country was, um, you know, had a BMI of 30% or more, or about 15% of the country did, and the other had up to 20. And so I'll just march through sort of quickly, but every five years we sort of add another category um, in a way that is pretty dramatic. Um, and to 2009, and the numbers, of course, for now, five years later, is even more. Um, but we, we're, the health impacts of the way that we've been growing and the way that we've been doing things um, is really significant. And we have to think about that. And when you look at childhood, the maps for childhood obesity, it's even worse. 
And so these are real costs to us. They're real, they're real, they're real things. Um, um, and we need, to be, we need to know about it and think about it. Of course, there's lots of reasons why this is a problem. It's not just the built environment. I don't want to suggest that. Um, but for me as a planner um, and an urban designer and an architect, it's important to start to think about the built environment and think about what our contribution can be to those answers. Um, and so one thing, you know, rather than getting the whole region of Atlanta to sort of sit in a group, lock elbows, sing kumbaya, and everybody sort of march forward, everybody doing the right thing. You know, we can't, we're not going to all agree on that, right? And so it gets back to this idea of the Beltline and these catalyst projects that are um, changing people's minds, changing people's ideas without having to sort of wholesale make everybody agree to something before we begin. Um, and so the Beltline is certainly doing that. It's changing um, people's um, ideas about where they want to live in town, um, how they want to get around. Our office is in Midtown. I work at Perkins and Will. Um, we're in Midtown across from the High Museum. And there's probably five or six people already who commute to, to work on the Beltline. So they live down in like Inman Park or Kirkwood and they ride through the, neighbor to the city until they hit the Beltline. And then they ride up the East Side Trail to Piedmont Park. They go through the park and then they sort of pop into Midtown. And they love it and I'm jealous because I live on the other side of town <laughs> and we don't have that yet, but uh, we will. So it's changing people's lives already, um, and maybe that's maybe that's good enough for now. Like maybe we just need to do these kinds of things, um, and then slowly we'll start to under everybody will start to understand uh, where we need to go, and where we need to go is probably lots of different places. But that's another discussion. Um, so the Eastside Trail is built. If you haven't been out there, you should definitely get out and see it. Um, the Sears building on Ponce, you might know it as City Hall East, it's the largest building in the southeastern United States, two million square feet. Think about that. It's being redeveloped right now uh, by Jamestown. It's going to have hundreds of thousands of square feet of retail, um, office, residential, everything is going to be in there and it's directly linked to the Beltline on the third floor with the little bridge. Um, it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty amazing. They did Chelsea Market in New York, if you know that. They're going to raise the bar for development uh, a few bars here in Atlanta, which is pretty exciting. Um, but already other things are happening. This is just south of there, the Fourth Ward Park. If you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. Take your kids on the Saturday. They've got a splash pad. Well, wait till the spring, I guess. Um, <laughs> but um, it's amazing. Um, and you know, like I don't even live on the Beltline and on the trail that's built now, but I'll take my kids. They're five and seven. We'll get our bikes in the back of my truck and we'll go down to the King District and we'll ride up. Uh, to Piedmont Park, uh, you know, get the pizza, ride back, you know, stop at the park or something on the way back. They love it. That's a fantastic way to get her, to just spend a day. Um, on the southwest Atlanta, where the city also owns the railroad, which is sort of the next phase for the permanent trail, um, there is, it is open for mountain biking and hiking. It's a great four mile trek through the woods. Uh, it's fantastic, uh, different kind of experience. Uh, the skate park is Atlanta's first skate park. It's on the Beltline right on the east side near the Carter Center. Um, these are my kids actually. We're at a park called Stanton Park on, in Peoplestown. Uh, the park was uh, fully renovated and also expanded and connected better into the community. Um, the design work is going on, is underway right now for the remainder of the corridor, um, including the transit. It's not just about the trail, but the transit's also being designed. Uh, Parkinson's Will has been hired by the, by the city to do the design work, so I'm happy to be able to take, to sort of be involved in the vision all the way through to construction documents, which has been fun. Um, but we're, that's underway for the Southwest. We just finished the uh, Southwest uh, schematic design. Um, and then here's some pictures of what it might look like. So this is just north of Ponce, old abandoned railroad. The trail on the right is built. If you're out there and you're, see, and you're on the trail and you see the sort of big dirt patch to the left. It's about to be planted with wildflowers, but in the future, it's that's where the transit line is going to be. Um, this is at Highland. Um, this is down, this is the pre-transit view um, before, down right the, or near the skate park and Freedom Parkway. Um, and and this, these are old sort of sketches. It's not really look quite like that, but the idea is that you have a really rich uh, physical environment, really exciting uh, spaces and places to go along the way. What's really amazing about the, the Beltline, though, in that, in that sense, that it's a catalyst for change, that, that it's, a little, it's an idea that a handful of people grew into a couple thousand people working to make happen, to sort of put the nuts and bolts together, to get the political support and the 
regional planning support and the funding and all of that, you know, we've been doing that now for 10 years at least. Um, but what's amazing is that it's happening in other places around the world too. When I was in Paris, this was just down the street from me, this is called the, well, it was an old railroad viaduct, it was abandoned, so the trains were high, and in the vaults below, it was just boarded up, and there were some mechanic shops and some parking and just random stuff like that. When I went back in graduate school a couple years later, it had been totally transformed into the Viaduc des Arts below, which is the uh, arts uh, studios, artist spaces, cafes um, below, and then the, the top where the railroad tracks were was turned into a linear garden, a walking space, um, which is really amazing for about three miles from the Bastille out to the eastern edge of Paris at the Bois de Vincennes. Uh, pretty amazing experience, especially in Paris, which is so hard and urban to be in this sort of leafy green space, three, three stories up from the street and sort of see the beautiful architecture of the city in that way is really amazing. And of course, has changed the way the, the whole life along that corridor in a pretty amazing, pretty amazing way. Um, what's cool is that the, the uh, Promenade Planté was a prototype, it's a little one and a half or three mile prototype for a 22 mile loop of old railroads around central Paris. I mentioned that, it's basically their belt line. Petite ceinture means little belt in French. Um, so it's their belt line and it looks like this and they're gonna make it into a tramway and a trail. It's a little bit different from the belt line because it's narrower, um, but they've b this is where it crosses over the Seine. Um, this is the tram, they've already, of course they've got they, they invest in these kinds of things, so they've already built the, the tram on the whole southern side of it, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, I mentioned the High Line. This is another project that had this really grassroots kind of origin. A couple guys wanted to save this old railroad viaduct, and so they, they fought for it. They got the political attention. They raised money um, from you know, all the New York celebrity world, and now it's this space for really beautiful people to hang out. It's really, it's really social space. It's really quite wonderful. Um, and is the top destination in New York City, according to Frommers, I think. Um, but there are a lot of uh, lesser known ones. This is the Midtown Greenway in Minneapolis. Similarly, old railroad corridor, bike trail on one side, and what's just off the picture there is a grassy strip where the transit will be in the future. Similarly, in Detroit, this is the Dukender Cut. It was a uh, railroad below street level that similarly tra trail on one side, tra future transit on the other, about three miles long. The Bloomingdale Trail in Chicago is an elevated, uh, really cool earthwork sort of structure about three miles through Wicker Park um, and uh, connect the river into the neighborhoods to the west um, will be a really great bike trail. Uh, this is uh, Viaduct Green in Philadelphia, which is about three miles long. Um, a third of it is underground like this in this amazing tunnel. A third of it is below street grade, but open to the sky. And the last third is like the High Line, an elevated structure up through the Callow Hill neighborhood and connecting down into downtown. It's an amazing sort of thing. And all these projects like the Beltline it did originally, like the High Line does have this amazing sort of grassroots movement. They're changing not only the physical form of those cities, but also the way that people think about those cities and where they might go and what they might do. This is the uh, Allegheny Riverfront uh, Boulevard in, in Pittsburgh which is gonna keep, do all of those things, but then also at, keep their active freight trains, which is pretty cool. And then of course, they're along the Allegheny River. You've also got the riverfront, which is uh, amazing for about six miles along the Allegheny River. Um, in Houston, uh, the bayou system that drains, a, drains the region is being transformed into an amazing greenway network. Um, Buffalo Bayou, which is downtown, um, you should, if you're in Houston, you should definitely go out and check it out. It's an amazing trail network. Just out of downtown, you can get a bike share downtown, swipe your credit card and go for a four mile ride. It's an amazing experience. But Buffalo Bayou is only one of about a dozen bayous and they just passed a referendum in, in uh, November for $150 million to invest in these greenways, trails all throughout the entire uh, metropolitan region, which is amazing and it sort of goes under highways. It's sort of this, for, like an old railroad, these forgotten spaces that are being rediscovered, um, repurposed, and sort of re-energized with new housing, new development, um, all kinds of things. And I mentioned the LA River and I saved it for last because it's really sort of my favorite. I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, every time I go to LA, which is a few times in the last year, um, I just take ha an extra half day. There's a park up off the Glenwood Narrows where you can sort of get into the river 
and just hang out there for a day. It's an amazing space. Um, and, and what they're doing is amazing. There's a grassroots movement since the 80s. Um, and they just within the last couple of years, they've made so much progress. The Army Corps of Engineers has designated a navigable body of water. The mayor of Villa Magrosa was out there kayaking in it last summer. I mean, that's an amazing kind of thing to do in the LA River um, and, get, and really starts to play with your mind a little bit about what you might do in the future in LA um, and change the way that you think about LA. You know, who have, even know it had a river, um, much less that it was somewhere that you would want to go. Um, so it's kind of cool, I think. And then the last thing is sort of, so that's, you know, old waterways, you know, that are channelized and old abandoned railroads. That's sort of the easy stuff, right? <laughs> what about roadways? What about obsolete kind of excessive roadways? This is Detroit, uh, where in Gratiot Avenue, you've got nine lanes, nine lanes and no traffic, you know? You might, you might think about doing something else with all that surface, you know, that m might actually make those communities into places where people wanted to live. So I did these little studies just for fun because I'm obsessed with Detroit and I think, I think, I actually think Detroit is the future. We're all going to be, we're all going to be following Detroit here in just about a year <laughs> or two or five. But um, they're, they're doing, a, they're doing some amazing stuff because when you're at the bottom, you have to be innovative. You have to be creative to get anything done. And that's what they're doing now. And what they're doing is pretty amazing. So anyway. I did this. Uh, so you take, you take that old, the old uh, street, you leave a few lanes for driving, uh, but you take the middle lanes and make it into a bikeway and a greenway, and that start, uh, spurs on new economic growth. It makes it into place where that guy on the bike, the hipster from, you, know, you might recognize from the <laughs> Minneapolis slide, he, he, he might be moving over there. Uh, actually, a lot of these hipster types are moving to Detroit. They call it the New Brooklyn. Um, but anyway, here's another sort of version where you take that, you know, keep your bus lane, economic development, blah, blah. And this is the last slide. But I mean, you know, in a, in a way, all those abandoned railroads and waterways, even Detroit is easy, right? Because you've got this amazing infrastructure on which to already build. The real challenge ahead of us is the farther out places, the places that we built over the last 50 years that don't have that robust infrastructure network. They don't, ha they don't have much in the way of um, an integrated network of streets. They don't have uh, transit lines. They don't have even former transit lines. They don't have much even busways or in, uh, c general connectivity or cultural institutions. You know, one of the amazing things about Detroit is that yes, it's decimated, but they have amazing cultural institutions, the library, the art museums, everything is just there already. And so what we do with this kind of territory, I think is the challenge in the future. And I don't have proposed to have any sort of answers to it, but I'm hoping that through these kinds of catalysts to change that we end up in getting in a place where we can figure that out. So thank you for having me very much. Uh, I, don't, I have no idea, I, don't, I have no idea how I did on time. So if we, ha I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Go ahead and take questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Do we have any questions? Anybody? Yes. I never uh, had thought about urban planning, but I was wondering in a diverse communities that we're getting more diverse as communities. Yes. How does, is that an additive or a negative to urban planning? Oh, it's definitely a positive. Yeah. The the well, actually, actually, it's a fair question. I, <laughs> if I think about that, I don't know. You know, in in urban planning circles, and you may also know this, that Portland, Oregon, is like this. Um, special place you know they've done a lot of things really right uh, over the last 30 years they've totally changed the way the downtown grows and they've invested a lot in transit and they've got a lot of new growth and development some have argued that they've been able to do that because they have a fairly homogenous population and so the diverse the lack of diversity actually um, allows them to politically get things uh, uh, moving along easier um, so in that sense maybe it's not so not such a great thing but certainly in the in the in the bigger picture looking ahead diversity is a huge plus what the what the global economy want when you read anything about what the future is going to be like um, diversity being able to speak different languages being able to relate to people who are different is so important because it used to be that we all live relatively confined lives within our small towns or whatever and we lived mostly among people who thought like us uh, either for, from whatever perspective. Um, but now, you know, we travel all over the world. We go different places. We do business with people in all parts of the country and all parts of the world. And being able to 
speak those languages, whether literally or culturally, um, is enormously important. And I think um, as, as, we, as we transition to an even more global, uh, globally dependent economy, I think that's going to be absolutely more important. Anybody else? Yes. How are projects like the Bell Line staying financially going forward? Uh, that's a great question. I can tell you um, the, the funding for the Beltline now is, is through a, basically a tax allocation district in Georgia, tax increment finance in other places. It, it's not a new property tax, but it leverages property tax to pay for the, pro the public good. So um, as if, if you have a piece of property and it's on the Beltline, it's in this special district, then if you redevelop your property, it's, it's more valuable. So naturally you're gonna pay more in property taxes and that incremental increase in property taxes that you pay would go to build the public amenity and build the very thing that attracted you to develop it in the first place. Um, that, that will generate about 60% of the pr project cost of the Beltline. It'll generate the local match for federal transportation dollars or whatever else. We also have a capital campaign. I'm on the board also of the Beltline Partnership, which is a nonprofit partner that does a capital campaign and all that. Um, we also have a bus tour. If you want to see a great Beltline tour, go sign up for the Beltline tour on Beltline.org. Um, so that's sort of the way it's been funding. Now that's slow money and it's painfully slow for those of us who want this to happen now rather than later. Um, but at least we have that in place. And we're, you know, the mayor is very much focused on make, making this thing happen sooner rather than later. And hopefully we can, we can do that. Um, but I think more importantly, and so every, all of these projects, what's common among them is that they not only have partnerships of organizations, they have lots of people involved trying to pull it off, but they also have lots of different funding, funding pots you know, that they're drawing from, whether it's even arts or brownfield money or anything, they're taking anything they can get to sort of make, take it to the next level. Um, and I suspect that that'll be uh, true for lots of the, uh, most of these kinds of projects forever. Hopefully though, it does start to change our minds collectively that this is something that we want to pay for. I think that you know, when you look at the, the uh, transportation referendum from last summer, um, the region defeated it clearly and, and, and strongly. <laughs> um, but the neighborhoods around the Beltline, when you look at the maps that were created of who voted for it, people in the city voted for it because they knew what they were getting. They knew they were gonna get, be getting $600 million for the Beltline and they wanted that to happen. Um, and so I think if you, know, if you could get, um, you know, at some point, either the city is going to be able to vote for itself or the region is going to come around to seeing the benefit of the Beltline and other projects for, for the larger region. And hopefully we can do that. But you know, right now for the Beltline, we're scrambling and trying to find whatever, whatever we can to make it happen sooner rather than later. Yes. I live in the stacks and I love walking to the Beltline. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, on the first hand, as I think that you'll see that the, the crime that there has been on the Beltline is not, uh, it's more, it, it's crime that probably otherwise would have happened on the street or something nearby. So I don't, I don't see, it's not, a, it's not a net increase in crime when you look at the statistics, but that is where it's happening um, in some cases. And the city has created a, the Atlanta Police Department now has a Beltline task force there, there's going to be mounted police and police on bikes on the Beltline, which is pretty, pretty cool. I met them. They started coming to our design meetings, actually, which is kind of crazy to have the police walk into a design meeting. Uh, but it's kind of intimidating, but it's cool. Um, so I haven't seen the mounted police out there yet. I've seen them on bikes, and they have a little golf cart, too, that they can drive on the, on the trail. Um, so they're definitely out there. I actually did see there's a guy who has a horse in town, and he rides it and my daughter and I were riding our bikes. <laughs> I don't know how he gets up there. We were riding our bikes from Virginia headed south towards Ponce and he, he, they were galloping along us while we were riding our bikes. It was amazing, it was fun. And my daughter, of course, she's seven. She's like, wow, you know, that's great. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? All right, well, thank you for having me. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.